I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Welcome back to The Cellar. This first story comes to us from Alwar, India. A man named Shivdayal Sharma, aged 82, was walking through the Rajasthan's Alwar district near the train tracks. Now, there isn't a ton of detail in regards to this first story, but Mr. Sharma, at some point, decided he needed to relieve himself, and he proceeded to do so near the train tracks. It was around 8 p.m. on a Tuesday night when the Vande Bharat Express train was making its way through this very area. As Mr. Sharma relieved himself, he never in a million years could predict what would come next. As the train approached nearby, a cow walked into the path of the train. The train would then strike the cow, sending its body on a head-on collision with Mr. Sharma some 30 meters away. The collision would instantly take the life of Mr. Sharma, who didn't even have a moment's notice to try and get out of the way. 29-year-old Tom Mansfield lived in Colwyn Bay, Wales. He was a personal trainer who prioritized the fitness of himself and his clients. This story takes place on January 5th, 2021. Tom had recently purchased a bag of pre-workout caffeine powder, with which he intended to use prior to his workout on this day. This particular bag of caffeine powder did not come with any type of measuring scoop, so Tom looked around his home for an answer to this dilemma. He would soon find his kitchen scale, so he decided that would work and he began to measure out his caffeine powder. Now, the recommended dose of this caffeine powder is between 60 to 300 milligrams, but Tom's scale started its measurements at two grams. Tom would proceed with using the scale and it is believed he measured out five grams of the caffeine powder. Now, for those of you that don't feel like doing any math or opening up their Google search, Five grams is equivalent to 5,000 milligrams. Tom would then add the powder to his drink and quickly swallowed it all down. Within minutes, it became clear something was very, very wrong. As his wife watched on in horror, Tom began clutching his chest and complaining about his rapid heart rate. It wasn't long before Tom was on the ground and foaming at the mouth. His wife quickly ran outside to get help from a neighbor. An ambulance was called, but by the time they showed up, it was far too late. The paramedics would immediately use a defibrillator to try and subdue his extremely abnormal heartbeat. He would be rushed to the nearby hospital, where they would spend close to an hour trying to save his life. But Tom would be pronounced dead at 4 p.m. Toxicology reports would later show that Tom had caffeine levels of 392 milligrams per liter of blood in his system. To put this into further context, after you drink one cup of coffee, an average person would have roughly two to four milligrams per liter of blood. No matter how healthy one person is, no one's heart could handle the overload of caffeine that Tom ingested on this fateful day. Now for this next story, I'm going to give a little bit of a viewer discretion as this next one is not for the faint of heart. Salman Mirza, age 25, checked he and his ex fiance into a hotel in Juhapura, India on June 22, 2021. From all reports, he and his ex fiance were both drug addicts with little money to spare. This lack of funds would lead them to huffing an epoxy adhesive for a quick high. It is believed this is exactly what they were doing on this very day. After getting high, the two decided they wanted to have sexual intercourse, but they were in a predicament. They had no condoms on them, and in the heat of the moment, 
they reached for what they found to be a quick fix. The epoxy adhesive they had just been huffing. Now, it is unknown if Salman applied this on his own, or if his former fiance applied this to him. Either way, the adhesive was applied to the tip of Salman's privates, and from there, the two would begin to do their business. Now, it's not completely known what went down afterwards, but the next day, Salman's friend found him unconscious in a bush near the hotel he had just been staying at. Salman would soon be rushed to the nearby hospital, but at this point, it was far too late for him. Salman would later die due to multiple organ failure due to the adhesive sealing off his body down below. If ever there was a story to promote don't do drugs, I think this one takes the cake. Every year since 1892, Stanford University and the University of California football teams have played an annual game towards the end of November or the beginning of December. This game would end up being dubbed the big game, and fans would clamor for a chance to see the rivalry game play out. This upcoming story is one of the most tragic and horrific stories I have ever covered on the channel. November 29th, 1900. The big game is taking place at the California League Baseball Grounds, otherwise known as the 16th and Folsom Grounds. A massive crowd of people showed up on this day to see the rivalry of these two great teams play out. To put it into perspective, admission to the game on this day was $1, which is roughly equivalent to $40 today. A large crowd of hundreds of people showed up to the game on this day actively seeking a way to watch the game, while avoiding the cost of admission. This led people to get creative. Spectators found seats on fences and nearby rooftops of buildings, anything to get a view of the historic game at hand. A brand new factory had recently been built across the street from the stadium. As game time drew closer, people saw this particular factory roof as the perfect place to perch themselves. Kickoff for the game took place at 2.30 p.m. that afternoon. The stadium was packed with over 19,000 spectators, not counting the hundreds and hundreds of spectators lining the roofs and fences all around the stadium. On this particular factory roof, a group of roughly 500 to 1,000 people had gathered and were enjoying the game from their free perch above. Now, to the factory's credit, Employees tried to phone the police about this crowd, but when they called, they were instead told to speak to the game's lieutenant. When the employees attempted to do so, the officers that were stationed at the stadium denied them entry. At around 20 minutes after kickoff, numerous people on the roof of the factory began to hear cracking and shifting sounds within the roof under their feet. Before anyone could react, the roof began to cave in and people started falling to the factory floor below. Now, it's bad enough to fall from a great height to the ground below, but what many of these spectators were unaware of is just what kind of factory roof they were standing on. This brand new building belonged to the San Francisco and Pacific Glass Works Company. Within this factory lied superheated ovens full of molten glass. It is reported, of the hundreds of people on the roof, at least 100 fell straight to the factory floor below. Now you could consider these people the lucky ones, as roughly 60 to 100 people fell directly on top of the furnace. This furnace ran at a temperature of 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 260 degrees Celsius. Many of those that landed on the furnace would begin to scream their bodies contorted and rolled into balls as they burst into flames. Others fell and managed to grab onto support beams within the factory. Some would survive, but others were just above the furnace. The intense heat would cause many to start to sweat, and before long, their hands would slip from the support beam, and they too would plummet to the furnace below. The blood-curdling screams echoed throughout the building, 
as employees attempted to use their long furnace pokers to separate and pry people away from the molten furnace. It was reported that some of those that landed directly on top of the furnace instantly started to cook, and some would burst into flames and fell directly into the molten glass furnace. When all was said and done, miraculously, only 23 of the hundreds that had gathered on the roof of that building died on this day. And for those of you that want to know, despite the incident that transpired, Stanford would end up winning the football game. 56-year-old Roger Miro and his wife lived in the 200 block of South Clubhouse Drive in Palatine, Illinois. It was Tuesday, July 20th, 2013, and Roger had just finished speaking with his wife on the phone at around 5 p.m. His wife had informed him that she would be going out with some friends after work and would be home later that evening. At around 6.30 p.m., Roger would knock on his neighbor's door and request the key to the trash room. According to his neighbor, Roger believed he had inadvertently dropped his cell phone down the garbage chute and he wanted to go to the garbage room to attempt to find his cell phone. The neighbor gave Roger the key and off he went. Roger's wife came home later that evening. When she stepped into their home, she yelled out for her husband, but received no response. After searching the home and finding her husband missing, she was extremely alarmed and immediately called the police at around 9.30 p.m. Police would arrive and began asking neighbors questions. It was at this time that the police were made aware that Roger was headed to the trash room to look for his cell phone. The cops then began their search of the underground parking garage. When they entered the garbage room, they found a ladder propped up against the trash compactor. As they approached the trash compactor and looked inside, they found the badly mangled body of Roger Miro. I was unable to find a lot of information overall on how everything unfolded, but ultimately, based on the police investigation and their findings, it is believed that this incident was simply a tragic accident. One could say it was a crushing way to leave this world. Lottie Michelle Belk, aged 55, was celebrating her birthday and wedding anniversary with a trip to Virginia Beach. Her and her family got together for a relaxing day of sun and sand. Unbeknownst to them, this day would turn tragic quickly. Now, there isn't a ton of information in regards to this particular case, but what has been reported is that Lottie Belk was enjoying her time with her family at the beach. This particular day was a windy one, with wind speeds clocked at around 20 to 25 miles per hour. An eyewitness on this day stated that in a blink of an eye, the wind picked up a beach umbrella and proceeded to propel this umbrella directly at Lottie Belk. The sharp tip of the umbrella would careen straight at Lottie and pierced directly into her. Emergency crews were called and when they arrived, they found that Lottie Belk was experiencing cardiac arrest as a result of the life-threatening injuries from the umbrella. She would be rushed to the nearby hospital, where sadly, she would succumb to her wounds shortly thereafter. Dr. Hitoshi Christopher Nikaido was born April 27, 1968, in Japan. Hitoshi and his family would move to the United States as a child. In 2003, Hitoshi graduated from the University of Texas Houston Medical School. He would then go on to become a resident at Christus St. Joseph Hospital in Houston, Texas. August 16th of 2003, another seemingly normal day at the hospital. That would all change as physician's assistant Karen Stigno proceeded to get aboard one of the hospital's elevators. It was noted in police interviews that this particular elevator had been previously out of order, but on this day it was operational and there was no sign present to warn of any possible issues. Miss Steinow 
boarded the elevator and pushed the button to head to the sixth floor. Moments after pushing the button, Dr. Hitoshi Nikaido made an attempt to quickly board the elevator as the door was closing. In a split second, the doors closed and Dr. Nikaido was trapped in the doors of the elevator. Ms. Steino reacted quickly and attempted to push the emergency stop on the elevator, but she wasn't quick enough. As the elevator began to rise, Ms. Steino watched in horror as Dr. Nikaido was partially decapitated right in front of her. The elevator would finally react to the emergency stop and came to a rest between the fourth and fifth floors, but it was far too late for Dr. Nikaido. When firefighters arrived, they found the body to be missing the head from the lower jawline up. Firefighters would then work diligently to rescue Ms. Stigno from the elevator. She was found in a state of shock as she had been trapped in the elevator for a time with the partial cranial remains of Dr. Nikaido. No matter how you draw it up, this was a horrible incident that simply shouldn't have happened. An inspection of the elevator's electrical wiring diagrams found that one controller stud had two wires connected to it, although the diagram indicated it should only have one. The controller stud on which the extra wire should have been placed was empty. The mistake bypassed the safety systems that would have kept the door from closing and the elevator from ascending. In the course of testing and retesting the elevator, the maintenance company had changed wiring and then they rewired it back to its original position but forgot to put the one wire back where it belonged. This mistake led to one of the most horrible fates I have discussed thus far on the channel. Larry Ellie Mario Moncada was reported missing the day after Thanksgiving in 2009. After an argument, he left his parents' house barefoot and in the middle of a blizzard. His family stated at the time that Larry was suffering hallucinations. He left behind both his keys and car and failed to return home. Larry was never heard from again. Ten years would go by before answers would be found within this tragic case. Larry himself worked at a local supermarket in Iowa. This supermarket was roughly a mile from his home. It is believed that in his distress, Larry ran to the local supermarket that he worked at on that Thanksgiving Eve. Investigators then believe that Larry climbed on top of the coolers within the store. Numerous employees stated in interviews that they used to climb on top of the coolers and hang out there during their breaks. Ultimately, it is believed that Larry fell from the top of the coolers into a gap of about 18 inches. This gap of 18 inches was between the 12 feet high coolers and a wall. Larry would then become trapped within this small gap. Now many of you may say, why didn't he call for help, being that he was so close to where people would be shopping? Ultimately, it is unknown exactly how everything went down, but it is believed that no one heard him based on how loud the cooler fans would be. Ultimately, Larry would die trapped in the grocery store, and what's even more unbelievable is that it would take 10 years before he was found. 10 years after his disappearance, the grocery store was working on a remodel. While moving the coolers out, Larry's body would finally be discovered. Even more sadly, numerous people would come forward after his body was found and speak out about the smell of decay they had experienced within this grocery store while shopping by these coolers. No matter how you piece this story together, no one should suffer such a horrible fate. Brian DePledge was a 38-year-old man who was at home one day doing the most normal of tasks imaginable, laundry. His story just goes to show that fate can come for any of us at any time and in ways we could never imagine. Brian had just finished a load of laundry and proceeded to place some of the wet laundry onto what has been described as a clothing horse, clothing rack, or error. As you can see in the picture, nothing about this looks dangerous. As Brian continued to put laundry 
on to dry, it is believed he tripped over a stool he had nearby and proceeded to fall backwards into the clothing rack. Brian's neck and chest became wedged in its rungs as it collapsed. He then tried to untangle himself by putting his right arm through one of the segments, but by pushing down on the bars, it tightened the grip like a concertina. On top of this, the clothes on the top of the rack were still wet. Their weight would have put even more pressure on his neck. Ultimately, the harder Brian tried to free himself, the more the entanglement put pressure on his neck. Sadly, Brian's body would be found later by police, and an autopsy would find that he died via asphyxiation. A detective was later quoted as saying, this was probably rarer than being struck by lightning or hit by a meteorite. It was 1982. A man named David decided he was going to go out and do some shooting with his trusty shotgun. He hopped in his vehicle and made a trip out to the desert near Mount Pleasant, Arizona. He hopped out of his vehicle, grabbed his shotgun, and began finding targets to shoot at. On this particular day, he found that the numerous cacti in the area would make for good shooting. He initially set his sights on some of the much smaller cacti, before then turning his attention to some of the much larger. The saguaro cactus is a tree-like cactus species that can grow to be over 12 meters tall. It is native to the Sonoran Desert in Arizona, the Mexican state of Sonora, and the Whipple Mountains in Imperial County areas of California. The saguaro is also a protected plant in Arizona. Statewide cactus laws prevent theft or destruction of any kind, but as it would turn out on this particular day, the cactus didn't need anyone else to protect it. In David's final moments, he had turned his attention to one of these massive saguaro cactus. He readied his shotgun as he had numerous times prior and fired into the 26 foot tall cacti. Now, according to reports, David must have been standing extremely close because to David's sheer horror and surprise, the shotgun had pierced through one of the large humanoid-like arms of this particular cactus. This caused the massive limb to break off and crush David beneath its piercing weight. It would not be long before David would succumb to his injuries, as it is believed that the huge and hard spikes had impaled him, leaving him unable to call for help as he succumbed to his fate. Philip was a 24-year-old man from Kent, Washington. Now, there aren't a ton of details to this story, so the logic behind Philip's decisions on this day are widely open for debate. Regardless, on this day in 2004, Philip made a decision he would not be able to come back from. Now, for context, lava lamps consist of blobs of wax suspended in a liquid enclosed by a glass or plastic container. The blobs rising and falling when the container is heated by a bulb at the base of the unit. The motion of the blobs is hypnotic and relaxing in nature. Philip owned his own lava lamp. Now, I'm speculating when I say this, but if I was to take a guess, I would presume that the heating element in Philip's lava lamp had potentially stopped working. This led him to the idea of finding a different way to heat the lamp up. His stove. As the lava lamp heated up on Philip's stove, all appeared fine for a time. But unbeknownst to Philip, this lava lamp had just become a ticking time bomb. And when it went off, Philip was standing directly in front of it. The lava lamp would explode, shooting shards of glass into Philip's chest. One of these pieces would pierce Philip's heart. Philip would then stumble out of his kitchen and into his room, where he would succumb to his injuries in mere moments. Mark, 26, of Headley Down, Hampshire, 
had been told by doctors his snoring was incurable. Mark had sinus issues, which were a large part of why he was constantly snoring. After trying everything he could think of to solve the problem, as well as being told by doctors there was nothing they could do, he and his girlfriend decided to think outside of the box. Mark decided on this particular night that he would use two of his girlfriend's tampons to plug his nose and subsequently stop snoring from happening. Now, when most people have a stuffy or blocked nose, they'll breathe naturally through their mouth. But to add to Mark's situation, he was currently using sleeping pills to help him sleep. And on this day, he had mixed those sleeping pills with alcohol. On this night, the combination of sleeping pills, alcohol, and his nose being completely blocked off by the tampons led to Mark asphyxiating in his sleep. His girlfriend would find his lifeless body the following morning. Now, anytime you're swimming, there's always the potential for danger at hand. You can drown in as little as one inch of water, after all. It was July 2022 in the town of Karmai Yosef in Israel. A man named Cleel was enjoying himself at a work event that had been organized by the company that he worked for. The company had rented out a beautiful villa that had a pool, and from all reports, everyone at this event were having a great time. Clill was swimming in the pool, enjoying the day, when suddenly, out of nowhere, the water level in the pool began to drop drastically. Without warning, a massive sinkhole opened up in the center of the pool. As you can see in this terrifying video footage, the bottom of the pool collapses and the water begins to flow into the sinkhole, taking with it inflatable rafts and pool toys alike. Numerous people there managed to escape, but Clill was not so lucky. He and one other person would be sucked into the nearly 30 feet deep sinkhole. The other man would manage to escape, but Clill was not so fortunate as the sinkhole would pull him towards his fate. The Times of Israel reported afterwards that the villa was frequently rented for parties, but it was quickly discovered after this incident that the owner had never properly applied for a permit to build the pool. This was likely because the permit would have never been granted due to the infrastructure problems at this property. At the end of the day, things could have gone a lot worse. Only six people were swimming at the time of this incident and it's only sheer luck that more lives were not lost on this fateful day. Cold therapy, also known as cryotherapy, can reduce pain, boost muscle recovery, and even aid in weight loss. Gaining popularity in recent years, Many facilities have opened across the globe that provide the treatment. Typically involves you standing in a chamber with your head exposed for upwards of two to three minutes. These chambers during this time reach temperatures of 160 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around Halloween in 2015. A woman named Chelsea, aged 24, was working at a Las Vegas spa from all reports, the day was as normal as any other, until closing time came around. Now details are scarce on exactly how everything went down, but it appears Chelsea decided during after hours to treat herself to a cryotherapy session. During this session, it is believed that she passed out or somehow lost consciousness. The following morning, her coworkers were greeted to a horrifying scene as they found Chelsea's body frozen completely solid. A truly icy fate indeed. Now this next story has some video footage that goes along with it. For the sake of keeping within YouTube's guidelines, I will be cutting the video short. If you'd like to view the entire video, it is available elsewhere on YouTube. This story takes place in China's Hubei province. It was 2015 and Zhang, aged 30, 
was enjoying a day at the mall with their two-year-old son. For a time, the day seemed just as normal as any other, venturing from store to store throughout the mall and enjoying the company of her two-year-old. That was until she decided to take the escalator up to the next floor in the mall. Now from video footage, the ride up the escalator was going just as normal as you would expect, all the way up until she reached the very top. That's when the floor paneling that conceals the inner workings gave way. Reacting quickly with a mother's instinct, Jang threw her child to the closest person standing nearby. And in a heartbeat later, she was pulled down into the churning machinery below. It would take rescue workers over four hours to recover the body. An investigation into the incident would find that maintenance had just recently been done on the escalator and the floor paneling had not been properly secured back into place. Personally, I will never view escalators the same way again. A zookeeper named Friedrich in Paderborn, Germany was dealing with quite the predicament. One of the elephants at the zoo was dealing with extreme and possibly life-threatening constipation. This led the zookeeper to try everything he knew to help ease the animal's burden. When all was said and done, the elephant had been given numerous bushels of berries, figs, prunes, along with 22 doses of animal laxatives. Still nothing was seemingly working for the poor creature. This led Friedrich to the idea of giving the animal an enema. As he began the process, the elephant finally let loose all that had been plaguing it. The sheer force of the unexpected defecation knocked the zookeeper straight to the ground, where he struck his head on a rock and lost consciousness. It wasn't until an hour later that someone else came around and realized what had happened. Poor Friedrich had suffocated under the weight of 200 pounds of elephant manure. A police detective was later quoted as saying, it just seems to be one of those freak accidents in a truly shitty way to go out. Gary Hoy was a 38-year-old lawyer and a senior partner at the Holden Day Wilson Law Firm in Toronto, Canada. It was July 9, 1993, and Gary was speaking with and giving a tour to visiting law students. Now, according to sources, one part of his routine was to show the students that the glass on the 24th floor was truly unbreakable. He had apparently performed this stunt numerous times and had all faith in the world that things would go exactly as they had so many times prior. He would run and jump into the window pane, and on his first attempt, all went as he thought it would. He bounced off, and no visible damage to the glass was apparent. So he decided to demonstrate one more time, and on the second attempt, the glass itself technically did not break, but it did completely pop right out of the frame, and Gary would instantly fall over 300 feet down to his death below. It was spring break, and two friends named Jake and Robert decided to go to a snowboarding competition in Stratton, Vermont. Both Jake and Robert were avid outdoorsmen, and in order to save money, they made a decision to dig a snow cave at the edge of the mountain resort's parking lot, while their friends slept in hotels and cars. Jake and Robert completed their makeshift cave sleeping arrangement and called it a day. Unbeknownst to them, the resort had a crew there that evening, sanding the lot and moving snow to clear the area for more parking spaces. While Jake and Robert slept, the crew worked into the night. As the sun rose the next day and the group of friends started meeting up for the day's events, they noticed Jake and Robert were nowhere to be found. A small group of them decided to check on the pair, but when they came about the entrance of their cave, they found it to be gone. Search and rescuers were called, but by that point it was too late. Officials concluded that a bucket loader 
had accidentally dumped snow right where Jake and Robert were sleeping, leaving the pair encased in their own icy tomb. It was a warm, bright, sunny day in California. A man, we'll call Mike, decided it was the perfect day to go scuba diving. He packed his gear and headed out for a day of underwater adventure. Some 20 miles away, firefighters were in the process of fighting a wildfire in the Los Padres National Forest. As with a lot of wildfires, helicopters were being used to get control of the blaze. These helicopters would make frequent trips back and forth from the Pacific Ocean to the fire. Crews would eventually succeed in extinguishing the blaze, and authorities would then begin a detailed assessment of the damage the fire had caused. To their surprise and horror, they found a burnt man in the forest. Even weirder, this man was wearing a full wetsuit, face mask, flippers, and dive tank. Authorities would later confirm that this was Mike. Apparently, against regulations, one of the many helicopters used to extinguish the fire had flown and dropped its bucket far too close to the shoreline, scooping Mike up and out of the ocean and eventually dropping him into the heart of the raging wildfire some 20 miles away. Jose was a 62-year-old worker at a bumblebee tuna plant in California. Jose had worked at this plant for over six years, doing all sorts of jobs within the building. One job he did often was load carts of tuna cans into a giant pressurized steam oven. The oven itself would reach upwards of 270 degrees and was used to sterilize the cans of tuna. It was just a normal October day at the plant when Jose was requested to perform some maintenance work on the company's 35-foot-long oven. While inside the oven, another worker continued working on loading over 12,000 pounds of canned tuna. After completing this task, the worker believed Jose had gone to use the restroom, so they shut the door and started up the pressure cooker. Within the next couple hours, it was noticed that Jose was missing, and a search of the property began. But it wasn't until someone turned off the oven and opened the door that Jose's severely burned body was discovered. Thank you all again for tuning in to another episode in the Horrible Fate series. You guys seem to really, really like these videos, so I'm definitely going to keep making them. I have a lot of fun doing the research and putting these videos together. And I just want to say thank you to all the new subscribers. If you have not subscribed already, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. And I will see you all again on the next episode of The Cellar. Thank you.